As many of you have commented already, that is oh. Diefenbaker. Anybody know what year that picture was taken? Nineteen sixty. So we are going to go. I will tell you the story today of religious freedom in Canada from seventeen seventy four briefly, and then the bulk of what happened, the benefits we have today, and the entrenchment. We'll look at the Charter of Rights. The entrenchment that happened in nineteen sixty under Diefenbaker was the result of a key court case that happened in the fifties in Canada. So again, we're focusing on the fifties, but the events of the nineteen fifties led to the formulation and the passing of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we uh, live under today. So we're going to get to this point. All right, so in your mind, what is freedom of religion and conscience? What, is it, what does it give you? What does it entail? What are its privileges? What are its roots? What is it? What does it mean? I tell you, you have, in Canada, you have the freedom of religion and conscience. What does that mean to you? Yeah, the government cannot tell you how to worship. Anything else? Not about conscience anymore. Yeah, interesting. You have freedom of conscience. Because like, you can't really say what you believe anymore. Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's where we'll get into the latter half, the last 20 years. I'm going to talk about a couple of key court cases, and we'll see, while this is in place, the effects of our society. Yeah, good job. Anybody else? What does freedom of religion and conscience mean to you? If you look at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, just this bottom section, Fundamental Freedom Section 2, everyone has the following freedoms. The first freedom, and in these documents, word order is critical. So the very first freedom you have is freedom of conscience and religion. Whereas no one can compel you to act against your conscience, which is an interesting argument. So if you're in a school system and the school says you must do this, you can say, no, that is a violation of my Charter of Freedom of Conscience. So I remember when Christina, there was a, a dance they had to go to and she didn't want to go. And they said, you know, in a sense, this is, and it was on Halloween in particular, said this is a violation of our right of conscience. You know, we don't celebrate Halloween in our house. We, we give a candy, but we don't celebrate it, right? So, and then freedom of thought, belief. Here's the tricky one that Doug alluded to, freedom of opinion and expression. Freedom, including the freedom of the press and other media and other medium of con communication. You have the freedom to believe what you want, think what you want, have your own opinions, and then to express them as you so desire. That's entrenched. Uh, freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association. You can associate or create associations, the Legion, the Lion Club, whatever, uh, and you can peacefully assemble without any restrictions. So this is the first freedom entrenched in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You should put this on your wall and every church should have this on the doorway. Because this is what allows us, under the current law, to function the way we do. And that's why all the challenges in the last year have been challenging the Charter. So, what is it about Canadian culture, what is it about Canadian values, that we stick freedom of rights, and uh, freedom of religion, and conscience as the number, one. it is not in the US, it's later on, freedom of speech comes later on. But in Canada, freedom of religion and conscience is so central to who we are that it's the first freedom that we stand on. So what do you think? Why is it Canadians elevate freedom of conscience and religion to such a high, to the number one spot of freedoms? Why is it our primary, our first freedom? Could it be something as simple as the, the leadership that was at the time that that's kind of what they valued, and so then they kind of put that on the country? Sure. It's a reflection of their values. Yeah. Could you close that door, Don? All right, uh, this information, by the way, I'm giving you this is the source, just so you know I'm not making stuff up. Uh, and this stuff is from last year, actually, so it's, it's relatively recent. Mm -hmm. Here's the status. I want to begin uh, this section on the status of religion in Canada. Those of us who obviously we go to church, we think it's, we're really in trouble. And you know, compared to the 1950s, yeah, massive decline. But it's probably not what we think it is. Uh, three years ago, Agnes Reed did a thing called Faith in 150 as Canada got older. And how do you think the situation in Canada compares to your home country uh, when it comes to religious freedom? Immigrants think uh, 
Canada is better, by only 43% of them think religious freedom is better in Canada. Their children think it goes into decline, but their grandchildren feel they have much more freedom than their parents did. Interesting observation. So I'm going to dump a ton of statistics on you, and you can decide what they mean. <laughs> All right. Donna. May 17th, 2017, how does a person's religious belief, or lack thereof, affect the way they think about social issues? I'll get you to pause there. That was the question Angus Reid was asking. How, do, how does faith interact with social issues? Keep going. New data from the Angus Reid Institute and Faith in Canada 150 suggests that faith plays an important role in the way most Canadians see themselves and respond to challenges in their lives. Likewise, roughly half say that their personal faith is important in shaping their approach to the issues of the day. So about half of Canadians claim faith of some kind or another, and then that faith intersects with society. And that's why this whole series that we've been doing for this length of time is what we're discussing, because people believe, and we know that to be true, that our faith intersects how we live our lives. And so it should. How are you doing great, Don? A slight majority of Canadians say that personal faith and religious belief is important to them in terms of defining their personal identity, 54%, overcoming challenges in life, 59%, and affecting how they view problems in their society, 52%. Two thirds of Canadians, 66%, say that there are absolute rights and wrongs that apply equally to all of humanity, while one third, 34%, say morality can be relative between people and cultures with different answers for different groups. So the, a small majority of Canadians that their faith defines their identity larger group identifies that helps them with challenges and how they view society. So Canada's really split between those of faith and those not of faith. Where it used to be probably 70 to 80 percent were of faith, now in our time it's about 50-50. So here's how Canadians view themselves. Um, the non-believers are the gray at 19 percent, the spiritually uncertain are 30, privately faithful, in other words their faith affects them privately but they don't practice it publicly. And the religiously committed, that would be you, you represent 21% of the population. So about 21% of Canada considers themselves religiously committed. How would you describe the importance of your own personal faith or religious belief in terms of uh, how you see yourself, your daily activities, how you deal with challenges, Donna read these up for us, and how you think public issues. So the, a small majority of Canadians say faith impacts how I think, who I am, how the government should function, and how I deal with the problems of life. It's interesting, now as we start to break it down, we see that um, men under the age of 34, are 18 to 34, are those at least would say that faith affects them. As we get up to men over 65, it bumps up not a lot, about 50%, but it is women between the ages of 35 and 54, who are the most religious in Canada. If you want, if you want to serve in a church, you better get along with women, is what this is saying. So, um, men 50, how do you, you think about it? 59% of men over 55 feel that faith impacts how they deal with their life. So, how would you describe the importance of your own personal faith or religious in terms of very important or not quite important? And again, your own identity, those who are faithful, you can just see the charts for yourself in daily life. Um, it's interesting that not the, uh, the spiritually uncertain are least impacted. Non-believers are actually more important by, affected by religious belief than those who are spiritually uncertain, because they've made a decision. Which of these two broad statements is closer to how you personally feel? People are fundamentally sinners and in need of salvation. People are essentially good and sin has been invented to control people. As you can well imagine, non-believers feel the latter, while Christians feel the former. Which of the two broad statements is closer to how you personally feel? Oh, that's the same slide, sorry. <clears throat> wow, that slide just keeps showing up. There we go. Would you say what is right or wrong depends on circumstances, or things are almost always right or wrong? It's interesting, even the religious are split. Even the deeply religious said, you know, sometimes circumstances determine ethics, right or wrong, and sometimes they are absolutes. 
Now, I'd be curious to see what questions were asked as for determining what's absolute. My slides are repeating themselves. Here we go. What is the best way to live your life? You should be more focused on achieving your own happiness or being concerned about what others think. Which province is the most generous and magnanimous and is more concerned about their neighbor than any other province? Saskatchewan. More people in Saskatchewan are concerned about their neighbor than other provinces. What is the least, the most selfish province? Quebec. Quebec. <laughs> wow. As of when? When was this data? 2017. Yeah, no, it's not. It's, uh... When it comes to issues like abortion and doctor assisted death, where do you personally place your highest priority? Freedom or preservation of life? Who is the most? It's the spiritually uncertain. It's those that are in the middle that struggle the most. Eh? While religiously committed, are just on the edge of at all costs preserve life, at all costs <coughs> for freedom. It's a bit of a loaded question. What I want you to see is that faith is interwoven through Canadian culture. The reason that freedom of conscience and freedom of belief is so critical is because Canadians are still, still spiritual people who want to express their faith. Now, whether it's, you know, me and God for a walk on a Sunday afternoon and I don't go to church anymore, or I'm committed to assembly. Whatever the nature of faith is, though, the majority of Canadians, a slim majority, believe there is something beyond this life. Um, and Trudeau, I, not a big... Okay, I'll let, it, let him stand the quote. Uh, Myrtle, would you quote Pierre for us? <laughs> Trudeau says that this idea that the, the golden thread of faith is woven through Canadian history. And I, I like it. It's a great metaphor. And we're going to see how that happens. So let's take a look at the roots of religious freedoms in Canada before we get to the current status. Root? Canadian common law is based on British common law. So when the BNA was founded, it was based on British common law. So we have to go back to British common law to get the very beginnings of the root. In 1215, when the Magna Carta was signed, the very first clause, uh, I, I'm guessing this is small for Bonnie? I mean, for Myrtle? Shirley? Yes. I'm looking right at you. Murray. The Magna Carta, 1215, the very first clause. This chapter has confirmed for us in our ears in perpetuity that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. So, at the very beginning of constitutional law in the United Kingdom, liberty of the church, in this case the Church of England, that was kind of biased, wasn't it? Um, undiminished rights and unimpaired liberty. So, our freedom, our religious liberty that we have in the Charter is rooted in the Magna Carta. And then we brought in Quebec. Canada's story of religion is so very different than the American story. The American story is one of a pioneer independent spirit. Canada always has the tension between French Catholic and English Protestant. And that is rooted. Everything that we do up to this major issue that I'm going to talk about that creates the charter is tied to French Catholicism in its tension against English Protestantism. So in 1774, when Wolfe beat Montcalm and the French colonies were lost to the British, the British took over the North America and it became British North America, they created, this is both the most Canadian document you can think of, the advent of accommodation, the Quebec Act. Fun. Following the unrest in the American colonies and grasping for stability in the wake of the failure to assimilate French Canadians, the British government enacted the Quebec Act in 19, or 1774. Article 5 guaranteed the French Canadians the maintenance of their language, religion, and civil law. This act gave the Crown's new French Canadian subjects civil rights as Catholics that their co-religionists in the United Kingdom would not enjoy until the Catholic Emancipation Act some 55 years later. So the French Catholics would not assimilate into British culture. So the government had to do something. So they gave, in 1774, that they could maintain their religion, their language, and their civil law. That's why we have the issues we do in Canada today with Quebec, because of the Quebec Act of 1774, the Great Accommodation. But what it did was it entrenched religious freedom into Canadian law. And if you could apply it to, to Catholics, you could also then apply it to others, because that's how Canadian law works. 
Uh, and so we get early on religious liberty entrenched in federal documents. Bonnie, you're doing great. Rather than seeking to eradicate the pre-existing structures and institutions founded, maintained, and operated by the Catholic Church, the Quebec Act preserved these religious and civil institutions, and in doing so, established religious freedom as a prominent force of pluralism and civility in Canada. Canada, has, Canada was founded on pluralism. You know, we, that's why we hear so much in Canadian culture about diversity and pluralism, because we were founded on two warring cultures living beside each other and having to sort it out. The French Canadians and the, Eng the Protestant Brits, again, or the Catholic French, and they said, we've got to figure out how to live along, beside each other. And so pluralism is ingrained in the thinking process of Canadian law. That's why we have it today. All because of Wolf and Montcalm. I always tell people Wolf won that war, but uh, mm -hmm. he lost the peace. Then in 1867, when Canada became a state or a nation under the British North America Act, it was the, the, the background language or the, the tagline today, we would say, hashtag two nations, one state. Because we had to create how do these two coexisting systems uh, not kill each other. Done. The British North America Act of 1867, subsequently the Constitution Act, brought British Protestants and French Canadian Catholics in Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick together into the Dominion of Canada. The British North America Act addressed the question of various denominational schools as the first schools established in what would become Canada were founded by various religious communities, both Protestant and Catholic. The history of Canadian uh, government is that schools and hospitals, care homes, were all religious. They were all church founded. Can you think of a, a hospital that has uh, church roots? St. Paul's. St. Paul's. Yeah. Winnipeg, St. Boniface, the Grey Nuns. Yeah. I mean, the word hospital is the word hospitality, right? It's a place to be cared for. And so the government says, okay, now what do we do with religion? Because religion has entrenched itself in education and health care. So, Section 93, Bonnie, if you would be so kind. Section 93 Sorry. is a provision for separate schools for Catholic minorities outside of Quebec and the Protestant minorities in Quebec and affirm the provincial government's jurisdiction over key areas like education, guaranteeing the rights of denominational schools. The new Canada was not based on the renewal of religion from public life, but on constitutional recognition of religious difference and distinctiveness. Within Canada, when did religion and politics partner up? We would say, you know, get into bed together. When? In 1867, the BNA Act. We have never had separation of church and state. There has always been a tie between church and state in Canada. You know, we hear a lot from America, and we're going to address this near the end, the difference between the American model of, of separation of church and state and the Canadian model. But within the Canadian model, state has always, all the state has always governed marriage, it has always governed divorce, it has always governed religious freedom. So you cannot separate church and state within Canadian law because it's, ingrained in the very beginning because of the French Catholics, right? So now you have in Manitoba and these places, these minority schools, these little French Catholic schools, well, you're not going to abolish them, but you let the province decide. And in Quebec, you have these little pockets of Protestant schools, the Anglican school and the Baptist school, whatever. And so you get all these protections. Later on, or last week, we saw in the Bible school movement, right? The Mennonites come to Canada and they start schools. The government says, go right ahead. They charter them. They give them the freedom. We have charter schools. Right? So we never had the removal or the separation of church and state. Rather, we had constitutional recognition of the existence of the church and its role in society. The government of Canada has always acknowledged the beneficial role of the church to the state. Very different than the American model. The core of the BNA Act recognized religious devotion, expression, and practice. And here's the key phrase. I have a role to play in informing the public good. The reason that our church doesn't pay property taxes is because the province of Saskatchewan recognizes that church plays a role in informing the public good. Therefore, it does not need to be taxed. So that phrase is central. And as long as the church continues to inform the public good, 
the relationship is stable. The, the state said churches are good for society as a whole, and we want to protect that goodness. Now, fascinating, eh? That we're supposed to be a good, we're salt in society. And then along came Manitoba. Oh, Manitoba. First had a rebellion, then they made a little postage stamp province, and then CBC made a vignette about them. Remember that little Manitoba government vignette? Is it really warm in here? Yes. No, okay, all right. <laughs> I, who said no so quick? Carla. I'm sorry. I'm just normal warm because I'm talking. So, remember, we've got French Catholic schools that are independent from the public school system. In 1890, we had the Manitoba School Crisis. Oh, bless you, Bonnie. It lasted 10 years, and it's considered one of the most controversial moments in Canadian educational history, and its heart was getting rid of this entrenched religious freedom that had been entrenched in the DNA Act only 26 years before. Joni, I think we're good with big words. First paragraph. <laughs> Oh, I read that already. Sorry. You can read the next one. When Manitoba was created, it had two public school systems, one French and Catholic, the other was English and Protestant. But by 1890, one of the fears of the Métis had come to pass. English Protestants... Oh, we missed a line. Immigration from Ontario had created a large English Protestant majority who... Resented. Right. Yep. Resented. Public funding for French Catholic schools. So, as the English people in the 1890s moved into Manitoba, there's been an exodus of, or an entrance of farmers, they became a whole lot more English speaking people in uh, Manitoba. And they're paying taxes for whose school? The French, the French minority school. They're going, why should my English Christian taxes pay for your French Catholic school? And there was a bit of a row over this issue. So the prophet said, what are we going to do? We've got a rebellion on our hands. Our taxpayers are screaming mad that they don't want to pay for French Catholic schools. Dylan. Responding to this pressure, the province passed the Manitoba Schools Act, which created a single, non-denominational school system in English only. So, so what did the province say? If you're going to argue about Protestant... It, uh, English speaking and French Catholic, we're going to do two things. We're going to get rid of them both, and we're not going to make either religious. They're going to be non denominational, and they're all in English. That's it. So, what they do is they booted both systems out and created a third system. And who do you think was happy? English people. English people, except the Christians were mad because now it's non denominational. You can't have your Anglican school anymore. It made everybody mad. Kind of like when you try to solve a problem between two children, you come up with a third solution, and both of them get angry. That's exactly what happened. Dylan. The Manitoba Schools Act actually defined both the Manitoba Act and the BNA Act, which had provisions to protect denominational schools where they existed at the time a province joined the Union. So Manitoba came in with this school system, and this law was counter to the federal law. So now we've got the provinces and the feds arguing over whose school gets to run. Well, they solved it. Painfully. Catholic leaders in Manitoba, Quebec, protested and appealed to the federal government to intervene. But Sir John A. Macdonald did not want to overrule or disallow provincial legislation. Who gets to make the call? Especially since education now is a provincial matter. But it was supposed to be. Uh, so you can see the frustration. The Catholic Church contested the discriminatory provisions of the act, leading to a national crisis involving the federal government. This was huge news in 1890. In 1896, under the pressure of his cabinet, Prime Minister Mackenzie Bowell resigned over this issue. So the Prime Minister quit over the effort to restore this balance of private schools. Dylan, you're doing great. Prime Minister Wilfred Laurier arranged the Laurier Greenway Compromise. I'll just stop there. What do we do as Canadians? We create a compromise. We create the Quebec accommodation. We create the Manitoba Compromise. This is very Canadian, by the way. I'm incredibly Canadian. Keep going, Dylan. This was to allow Catholic education after classes and obtain the support of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. The Laurier Greenway Compromise added some measures for language and religious instruction half an hour after school, but took away much of the status of the French language in the province and basically upheld the single school system introduced in, by Greenway in 1990. 
So the compromise was you could have your religious classes, but after school for a half an hour. On your own time. On your own time. You, you think as a kid, is this going to be appealing to you? I get to stay an extra half hour and have religious instruction. Oh, yay. It was a compromise that was very Canadian because it didn't work ultimately. Meanwhile, Ontario, Quebec, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Newfoundland funded both school systems, Catholic and Protestant, where New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and British Columbia did not. So in Saskatchewan, we have separate schools. Jonathan had Christ the King. Um, Unity. Unity has a Catholic school. That's right. All ties back to this act. In 1905, Laurier failed to secure guarantees for the Catholic education in the new provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta, although we have a separate school system. All right, so that's the next one. To understand free, freedom of religion in Canada, you got to go to the Magna Carta, then the BNA Act, and then this tension between how you deal with public venues, because the religion in Canada is so to the forefront of society, it's entrenched in the school system and the healthcare system, the two biggies now that the government actually completely controls in many ways. So between 1836, sorry, 1936 and 1959, uh, the government went to great lengths to protect religious minorities. Now here's the big story. This is the event that causes the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to be drafted by uh, Stephen Baker. JWs were banned in Canada during the Second World War. They were viewed as anti-Canadian interlopers or seditious people, right? And they experienced increased persecution, especially in Quebec. Because in Quebec, what are you? You're Catholic. And JWs were going door to door and telling people how bad the Catholic Church was. They were undermining Catholicism and people were starting to listen. And that did not go well. And one commentator claimed that in the 1950s, the Inquisition had arrived in French Canada. They were out to destroy, and by legal means, the presence of JWs. Which brings us to Frank Joyce. Frank Roncare. Okay. He was a successful restaurant here in Montreal. His restaurant, Croix, was in a busy section of the city and had been passed down to him by his father. The restaurant had received a liquor license for every one of the last 34 years. Ron Torelli was well educated and enjoyed a very good reputation for running a popular high end restaurant. So, Frank is wealthy. He's established, he's a good Italian, but he's not a Catholic. You had great choice. He was also a Jehovah's Witness. Members of that religion were good at rattling the established Roman Catholic Church in Quebec in the 1950s, the largest social influence in the province. When was the last time the Seventh day Adventists were the largest social influence in the province? The Catholic Church is the largest social influence, and into that comes the JWs, and they are, well, we'll see. Danny. In 1,000 such charges for So what do JWs do? They go door to door and what do they give you? The Watchtower magazine, right? So they were selling this Watchtower magazine. And this idea that religion and politics are separate in Quebec, because it's the politicians who are mad because they're good Catholics. And so if you're a politi politician, you, what tool do you have in your pocket? All the political means of the state. So now, it's, it's two pieces of paper correct, glued together. And they're going to deal with these JWs. Uh, Dan, you're doing great. The city of Ottawa was an act This is Montreal. Requiring a license for peddling any kind of wares. It was rounded up and arrested close to 1,000 young old women and women who were offering their leaflets on the street corners. The fine was $40 for a large sum of the time. They accused all pleas of not guilty when they asked so they would go to jail, they'd get arrested, they go to jail, that $40 bond, the state said these people, they're kids, they can't afford 40 bucks, right? That'll keep them in jail. But 
That very day, Frank's lawyer would go with cash in hand and bounce them up and they'd be back on the street the next day. How do you think the Catholics are feeling? <laughs> Who's the problem they have? Frank is the problem. We gotta deal with Frank. Because Frank's back paying tens of thousands of dollars in fines because he can't. All right, Colden. You can call Frank. Now that Duplay is the uh, premier of Quebec at the time. Right. So <laughs> Frank's the problem. We got to deal with Frank. Yeah. All right, Felicia. The all important liquor license at Ron Canelli's restaurant was coming up for renewal by the Quebec Liquor Commission. The chief prosecutor in Montreal and the head of the commission discussed it. Then the commission head called Premier Duplessis to ask what to do about Ron Canelli. The Premier agreed that the matter was most serious, but they should be certain that this man. <laughs> that this man who wanted the liquor license renewal was the same person involved in this surety bail. A private investigator was hired to confirm his identity. Is the government now operating within its framework? No. It's stepped outside. This has nothing to do with the Premier. But it sure does. You do great, Felicia. The next row of witness fact was another bombshell. Under the banner of Quebec's burning hate, witnesses seared the province by condemning what they called the savage persecution of Christians. So the Jehovah's Witness pushed back. Grady! Uh, now the line had been crossed. The Premier, who was the Attorney General, ordered all the copies of this tract were to be seized, and one witness was charged with the obscure crime of sedimus libel. Libel. Libel, did you? Within the week, which also happened to be the uh, Frank, when Frank applied <laughs> So they said, huh, we know how to get you. The premier is also the attorney general, the head of the, head of the prosecution. I'll just pass the word down. You don't get your liquor license ever again. Wow. Is this legal? No. Not at all. This went to the Supreme Court. I'm going to jump ahead, then we're going to jump back. But the decision on December 4, 1946 was pr presumably to punish Frank and to curtail his financial ability to support people charged with offenses. It was a warning to others that they would similarly be stripped of provincial privileges if they persisted in supporting witnesses. Religious freedom is being manipulated by the state. Well, it goes to the Supreme Court, and we'll look at the document in a moment. The decision led to the dismissal. And it gets overturned. I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But a thousand of these cases are dropped against it. All right, let's go into the story. When the liquor license was not renewed, Frank's restaurant business declined. You can't sell booze in Quebec. And was sold within six months. It worked. In six months, he went out of business. He was not charged with any offense like the other two JWs. He would have to start his own action taken on the Premier. If he wants justice, who does he have to go up against? He's got to go against the Premier. There was no precedent in Canadian law for a store owner to take the Premier of a province to court and he charges him, he files a lawsuit against the Premier, seeking so $119,000 in damages. All right. 13 years it sat in the courts. Finally, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a decision. After a five-day hearing in court, the two Francophone judges, son, the sons of the previous Premier, were the strongest defenders of the Premier and found no legal wrong. They had taken the same position in other cases. Six ruled against the Premier, saying that there is no such thing as unlimited discretion or power in public authority, including the Premier. All right, this is a very long document. This is, we're gonna jump ahead to page 122. <laughs> Donna. The plaintiff, the proprietor of a restaurant in Montreal and the holder of a license to sell intoxicating liquor, sued the defendant personally for damages arising out of the cancellation of his license by the Quebec Liquor Commission. He alleged that the license had been arbitrarily cancelled at the instigation of the defendant who, without legal powers in the matter, had given orders to the commission to cancel it before its expiration. So now he's bringing out the Premier's corruption. You're doing good on it. 
This was done, it was alleged, to punish the plaintiff, a member of the Witnesses of Jehovah, because he had acted as bailsman for a large number of members of his sect, uh, charged with the violation of municipal bylaws in connection with the distribution of literature. All right, this is hell. This is the judges, by the way, uh, the guys that dissented. These three are the sons of former premiers. The action should be maintained, and the amount awarded at trial should increase by 25000 See, man, he had really been worked over by the premier. But wrongfully, without legal justification, causing the cancellation of the permit, the defendant became liable for damages under Article 1053 of the Civil Code. So the premier lost the court case, and uh, Frank won his case 19 years later. The defendant was not acting in the exercise of any of his official powers. What this is saying is that the state has no right to persecute religion for its own bias. There was no authority in his department enabling the defendant to direct the cancellation of his permit. The cancellation of it was entirely outside his legal function, exercise of his, and so on. His position was not altered by the fact that as he thought it was the right, a duty to act and did so. Just because the premier thought he was doing the right thing doesn't mean it was the right thing. Page 123, Donna. The cancellation of the license was made solely because the plaintiff's association with the witnesses of Jehovah and with the object and purpose of preventing him from continuing to furnish bail for members of that sect. The court saw this for what it was, intentional persecution of the freedom of religion. The appellant, being a person, did they explain what he had done? He had put up Three, $40 for 380 cases. Uh, this just talks about when he was the guy who won the liquor license. He aroused community disaffection generally. All right, we won't keep reading, there's lots here. Here's the end of it. Damages to goodwill and reputation of the business, 50,000. Loss of property rights to liquor permit, 15,000. Loss of profits for a period of one year, 25,000. And so he was awarded, he asked for 119, got 90. Needless to say, Murray. The decision contributed fundamentally to moving beyond the two nations' lens to capture the full range of religious diversity that has existed over time in Canada and to ensure justice and religious freedom for those of all religious and belief backgrounds. The state cannot use its power to suppress religion. Up to then, the, the, the lens through that the government looked at was the two nation states, Catholics and Protestants. Along came the JWs, who were a minority sect. They were a cult. And they realized that this is a reflection of a greater diversity. This wasn't a battle between the two, you know, two giants. This was this third party. And they began to realize that in Canada, there are also a lot of other little religions. And those religions deserve the same protection under law as the two big ones did. That's why this is absolutely crucial. Because the JWs won their case in court. After losing his restaurant, Frank found work in highway construction, moved to the U.S., and he died within a few years of the decision that he made. So his life ends tragically. This becomes the groundwork for the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Bonnie. John G. Isa Baker called consistently for a Canadian Bill of Rights as early as 1943, partly due to the focus of the United Nations to establish global human rights standards. Religious communities across Canada launched nationwide campaigns in favor of passing a Bill of Rights. Diefenbaker saw what was happening in Quebec and realized potentially how easy that can happen to any religious minority. So he becomes the champion of the Canadian Bill of Rights as early as the early 40s. You're doing great, Bonnie. Following the persecution of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Quebec and intense lobbying of Parliament, the Bill of Rights was passed in 1960 under Prime Minister Diefenbaker. The Bill of Rights that we read at the beginning is here today because of Frank Roncanelli and his quest for the freedom of the JWs in Quebec. Probably doesn't think that way. So this is what the document we have today done. Section 1 includes the protection for fundamental freedoms. With Section 1C. Section 1C, providing for freedom of religion. Bonnie. The preamble to the Bill of Rights reinforces 
reinforces the role of religion in the Canadian point square. It seeks to acknowledge the supremacy of God and affirms that institutions remain free only when freedom is founded upon respect for moral and spiritual values and the rule of law. Strange thing about being Canadian is you often know more about the Americans. You know, we the people, in order to uphold a more perfect union, to establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility, whereby for the common defense or something else, that's the preamble to the American Constitution. I got part of it. But the preamble of the Canadian Charter actually begins with, we acknowledge the supremacy of God. <laughs> Here we go. This is the preamble. The Parliament of Canada, affirming that the Canadian nation is founded upon the principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God. Canada is built not on the separation of church and state, but by the fusion of church and state. That the state itself recognizes that God is the supreme authority. We are not a secular state. We are a religious state. Founded on this. The dignity and worth of the human person and the position of the family in society for a free man and free institution. We are founded upon the dignity of all people, the foundation of the family, and the supremacy of God. Isn't that a great value? But like we as Canadians, we often kind of you know, hang our heads compared to our neighbors to ourselves. We have them beat by an arm and a leg. Because this is the core. Supremacy of God, the dignity of the person, and the position of family. We actually entrench the value of the family into the charter. That we are free people with free institutions. Affirming also that men and institutions remain free only when freedom is found upon the respect for moral and spiritual values and the rule of law. What are the three foundations of all Canadian law? Morality, spiritual values, and the rule of law. That's the foundation of all Canadian law. It's built on this. We recognize that, we are, that there are morals, that there are spiritual values, and the rule of law. Anybody who violates your spiritual value is violating the foundation of the church. How did we get where we are? All right, this is the Bill of Rights. Do it. Part one. It is hereby recognized and declared that in Canada there have existed and shall continue to exist without discrimination by any reason of race, national origin, color, religion, or sex the following human rights and fundamental freedoms, namely the right of the individual to life, liberty, security of the person, and enjoyment of property, and the right not to be deprived thereof except by due process of law, the right of the individual to equality before the law and the protection of the law, freedom of religion, speech, assembly and association, and of the press. Is there a separation of church and state? No, the state actually guarantees that you are protected by your religion. The right of the individual to have equality before the law and protection, the law is there to protect your freedoms. Law can also in A where it says not to be deprived thereof except by process of the law. So yes. the law precedes yes. overall. Yeah, exactly. And the law is based on the previous slide. The authority of God, the religious values. So the idea is that our laws are based on the sovereignty of God, morality, and religious values. They should form inform the law, and that law, which is informed by those values, protects you. Where is the weakness? Because <laughs> the law is made by sinful people. Right. So, all right. We got to stand to reason that every law that should, should be made in the lens of God. Yes. That's what Kevin Canadian law says. The supremacy of God. Every law in Canada should be filtered through the supremacy of God in all things. Mm. The Peace Tower says, he shall have dominion. Yeah, this is why we, the fight we have is the law is on our side. <laughs> Here's the classic example, I'll wrap up with this. Prior to 1985, did you shop anywhere on Sundays? No. What was closed? Everything. That was called the Lord's Day Act. I have a friend, Kathy Tucker, and she's a cop, and she would enforce the Lord's Day Act. She would go to stores and buy gum. Keep the receipt on Monday morning. T file the charges, violation of the Lord's Day Act, you sold gum on Sunday. She went to this one store so many times, he, he would just walk up and just give her the receipt and the gum, she never paid for it. She said, I know why you're here, you know, you're here, okay. And he, she just kept charging him over and over and over. Well, Big M Drug Mart from Alberta decided we're going to open on Sundays. You can thank Alberta for this, by the way. Come on.
The end of the Lord's Day Act is an Albertan thing, and you'll see why. They challenged the charter in the Constitution. Big M Drug Mart was a retail chain, chartered the very first, and they, well, there were, were thousands of stores were charged, but they challenged it. And how they challenged it was fascinating. The response, again, this is from the actual, this is just a cut and paste from the Supreme Court documents. The rejoice. The respondent, Big M Drug Mart Limited, was charged with unlawfully carrying on the sale of goods that was slightly contrary to the Lord's Day Act. The respondent was acquitted at a trial. The Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. They were found not guilty of violating the Lord's Day Act. Go. The constitutional questions before this court were whether the Lord's Day Act, and especially uh, Section 401, gave the right to freedom of conscience and religion guaranteed in the Charter. Two, were justified by Section 1 of the Charter, and three, were enacted pursuant to the criminal law of power. Section 9127 of the Constitutional Act of 1867. Aren't you glad that you're lawyers? <laughs> what Big M claim was that the Lord's Day Act violated their freedom of religion because it enforced another religious belief, Christianity, on their faith in currency, which was their religion, really. And could Christianity enforce its values, its morals, its practices, the Lord's Day, on other religions in Canada? So interesting. A business used freedom of religion to challenge the Lord's Day Act. And what? Joyce. Since the acknowledged purpose of the Lord's Day Act on long standing and consistently maintained authority is the compulsion of religious observance, the Act offends freedom of religion and it is unnecessary to consider the Act the impact of Sunday clothing upon religious freedom. So, because the Lord's Day Act enforced Christian religion, it violated the freedom of religion other people had. All right, this is long, I'm going to read quick. The Lord's Day Act to the extent that it binds all to a sectarian Christian ideal, Sunday, works as a form of coercion, inimicable, or the opposite. You're trying to coerce people to follow your religion, and we have to protect all religions. The Act gives the appearance of discrimination against non-Christian Canadians. I want to work? You can't tell me not to work. That's a Christian thing. Religious values, remember that was way back that we just read, rooted in Christian morality are translated into a positive law binding on believers and non-believers alike. Exactly what the Lord's Day Act did. It took Christian law, thou shalt not work on the Sabbath, and bound it or forced it on everybody. Non-Christians are prohibited for religious reasons from carrying out otherwise lawful, moral, and normal activities, selling gum on a Sunday. Any law purely religious in purpose which denies non-Christians the right to work on Sunday, denies them the right to practice their religion, and infringes on their religious freedom. See the dance? You can't enforce... So, the state protects your freedom of religion, but the state cannot enforce religion on anybody else. Particularly, your religion on somebody else. The protection of one religion, and the contaminant non-protection of other reports, a disparate act destructive of the religious freedom of society. That makes sense to you? So, the power to compel on religious grounds the universal of observance of the day of rest preferred by one religion is not consistent with the preservation and enhancement of the multicultural heritage of Canadians recognized in section 27 of the Charter. So the Lord's Day Act was repealed on the grounds of freedom of religion. This established a broad definition of religious freedom that set a precedent in Canada. Freedom of religion is the right to entertain such religious beliefs as a person chooses. The right to declare religious beliefs openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal and the right to manifest belief by worship and practice or by teaching and dissemination. That's what freedom of religion... At the beginning I asked you, what is freedom of religion? That's the Canadian definition. But you cannot enforce your freedom on someone else's freedom. So you can't say to people, well, my religion says we should all wear, uh, what's that thing called, Joni? Duke. Duke. Duke? Duke. Yeah, so my religion says <laughs> that all women have to wear a duke. Duke? You cannot enforce that on other people. You see where freedom of religion is important. But you they can make you work on Sunday. Yes, your employer can make you work on Sunday. So now we live in Canada.
All right, I'll wrap this up to our curative. A Canadian ballot, where a Canadian ballot was struck. Under Frank versus Duplaise, it was ruled that the state cannot suppress or control religion. Under Big M Drug Court, that religion cannot suppress the state. This is about as Canadian as you're going to get. The state cannot suppress religion, and religion cannot suppress the state. We are one. We are united. But we can't suppress each other. <laughs> All right. We'll pick it up next week with 2004 Accommodating the Difference Syndicate Northwest versus Amsalo. I've got a question. Sure. Just from Quebec. We adopted a child and that came with bad luggage. <laughs> from Quebec. Now, I think Quebec is the home of bad luggage. <laughs> Still recording. Christian's not here today, is he? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing we're not live. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, 